So we're in the 24th Sunday of the year, and um, a very well-known gospel, uh, the parable of the prodigal son, and also two other parables. In fact, we're basically reading the full chapter 15 of Luke, and so it's a long gospel today. Um, and um, we see that um, these three parables are to kind of bundled together, but he's, Jesus is using these parables to address a certain audience. Uh, the context is important. So let's, um, let me read the opening lines of chapter 15, just to set the context. It says that tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Jesus to listen to him. But the Pharisees and the scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them he addressed this parable. All right. So we see here that there is a, a an intended audience, and that affects how we see these parables, especially the third one. Uh, where we tend to focus a little bit on the first son, but the second son is really the one who <laughs> is the target for the audience. So we'll see that when we get there. In a way, these parables have been interpreted in a number of different ways. You know, we kind of settle down and hear these parables, but in the beginning they were like riddles. What's the real point here? You know, uh, there's a, a riddle-like quality to parables that, as I say, because we've been reading them for 2,000 years and we sort of have certain go-to explanations for them, that we miss that point. That it's like a riddle. Uh, it could have, or like a diamond has different facets. It could have several different understandings. It's not like we're locked in only to one. Now, with that in mind, um, I'm going to give a slightly different interpretation to these parables. But just to help you to understand the riddle-like quality of a parable, let me just give this. It says, uh, you know, let's just say I make up one, um, that a man went to wash his car and he brought with him soap and water and a bucket and, you know, the hose. And he, and he went to work and some of the dirt came off right away. Some of the dirt he had to scrub to get off and some of the dirt wouldn't come off at all. Let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Bye. And off, <laughs> off goes the, the preacher. And like, well, uh, I sort of get it, but, uh, you know. And so you're, 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 you're left to think, to ponder it. It, it leaves you wanting more. Hmm? That was the technique of Jesus. So with that in mind, let's look at these parables, which do have some oddities about them. Um, they're not just pithy little stories. They, they, are, they are challenging at times to understand. Now, um, let's look at each of them. The first parable, uh, I won't read all these because, you see, it's, it's just, it would be, it'd be too long. Um, but uh, presuming that you've already read them or are from, certainly familiar with them. The first parable is the parable of the lost sheep, and he says, you know, what man among you having a hundred sheep and loses one won't leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go in search of the lost one? You know? um, I don't know that I would do that. I mean, now, first of all, you know, we're talking about leaving them in the wilderness. Ninety-nine. And this other one went, oh, man, I, I might look over the next brow of the next hill, I don't know that I just leave 99 sheep untended um, and run off to the others, you know, to find the one that was lost. Now, some explain that, and this may be something to this, that, you know, there, there were usually several shepherds in a field uh, near a certain town, and they, all their sheep would intermingle or whatever, um, and uh, there might be other shepherds there to look over the other sheep. But it, it doesn't, the parable doesn't say that. Um, and... Uh, so again, we're left kind of like, would I really leave 99 and go in search of the one? You know, it's nice to know that God will do that. Now, the fathers of the church had an explanation, a number of them, that said, well, the 99 are the angels in heaven, and the one lost sheep is us, and the Lord left the 99. But, you know, the problem there is that it says he left them in the wilderness. Well, heaven's no wilderness. So, you know, you're, you're kind of like, mm, okay, but it doesn't quite fit the facts, so, all right. But nevertheless, that's the more common explanation among the fathers of the church. It's a, it's a parable about how Jesus left the 99 righteous, namely the, the angels in heaven, to go in search of the one the lost sheep, namely us. Uh, and But anyway, when he returns, he says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep, and there's more joy among, notice, the angels in heaven. Then over one sinner who repents, and ninety-nine, then over ninety-nine others who have no need uh, to repent. And of course, that makes well. Who doesn't need to repent? Well, again, if if it's the angels, they don't need to repent. Uh, they've they've already perfectly followed the Lord. 
So again, there's a lot of, um, hmm, makes you kind of scratch your head moments. Now, there's a third explanation that I want to offer you <laughs> that says um, that, that, that this is kind of crazy. It's just crazy. Um, nobody would leave 99 to search of the one. I mean, you, you just say, well, too bad. I mean, you make a, a quick search, but you wouldn't leave. So, and, and, and what Jesus' point here, if we take this approach, would be to say, well, <laughs> the, God is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he is. He, he's crazy in a, way, in a way that defies human reasoning and understanding that his grace for us is amazing. It goes beyond any explanation that makes real rational sense to us, not to God, but, but to us. And um, uh, so Jesus is saying, you know, you, you want to see everything kind of in human terms, but um, um, you got to start to see more as God sees. You know, even one lost sinner, one lost sheep is so precious, he'd leave 99. Um, knowing they don't need to repent to go in search of the one. and It's kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. Now, the second one, we understand, I think, money more than sheep, you know, sheep or, or shepherding. Um, uh, there's a woman who has 10 coins. She loses one, and she searches diligently for it until she finds it and then calls her friends together and, in effect, has a party. <laughs> the party probably costs more, as much or more as the lost coin. It's just, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> What's going on here? You know, now again, some people, well, you know, you know, kind of a, 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 a the particular coin that's described is is probably a, a day's wages, so it's not small. Um, let's just say it's a hundred dollars. Actually, you know, in, in modern U.S. dollars, how you measure these things, it would be more like, um, you know, uh, you know, ten to fifteen dollars. But remember, they 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 didn't earn as much in those days, so. Again, we have about maybe a hundred dollars, uh, you know. And again, I would if I lost a hundred dollar bill and I had nine others, I'd say, okay, well, let me keep my eye out for that. But I don't think I'd stop everything to find it. And then when I found it, have a party that used most of it up. I, it doesn't make sense. It's kind of. And so, in other words, maybe the idea here is that um, well, God is kind of crazy <laughs> by human standard. Don't try to figure him out based on your human way of assessing value and so on. God has uh, the, the, the care of every soul on his mind, and what he does is kind of crazy to our way of thinking. And so it's described in these Pharisees saying, you know, you're so earthly, you're so, you're so vain, and, and you, 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 don't, you don't understand how God the Father thinks, see. And every one of these sinners is precious to him. You've written them off, and you hope for their destruction, you know. That's not, way, that's not the way my father is. Now, there's other explanation, and maybe this is a special coin. It was part of her headdress, her wedding headdress, um, so on. Um, part of her wedding dowry, you know. Um, but again, she's got nine others, and, you know, so I, I don't know. I'd be kind of like keeping my eye out for that missing $100 bill or whatever, and, and uh, I'd uh, certainly be happy when I found it, but I doubt, I doubt I'd spend it all away. <laughs> so, but I'm just... I don't want you to miss the kind of crazy making or crazy like qualities. You know, God is crazy to love us, first of all, <laughs> and uh, to love us in such a powerful way, um, in a unique and a special way, kind of renders him sort of not the way we think. You know, we're much more mercenary about stuff, honestly. Okay. And now we come then to the to the well-known parable of the, of the lost son. Um, now, I, I, I think... That once again, we miss a lot of the craziness of this parable. Um, and again, it's too long for me to read the whole thing, but look, let's, let's start just with the first son. He basically comes to his old man and says, Old man, you ain't dying fast enough. I want my share of the inheritance now uh, so I can go off and do what I want. Um, in other words, he's saying, Drop dead, old man. Now, no son in the ancient world, even most of the Middle East today, would ever speak to his father this way and get away with it. I mean, you just don't speak to your father in this manner. You can be disowned. It's, 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 there's even such things as honor killings when, when, a, when a son or a daughter completely disgraces the family. I'm not saying I support it. I'm just saying that you see how contrasted this is because the father gives it to him. I said, whoa. I mean, what ancient father would do this? So that's crazy. And they're listening to this parable, and um, he takes it, and he runs off with it. And you know the story. He, he falls into such debasement that he's looking up to the pigs. <laughs> it's awful. And um, he finally returns to his father. You know this part of the story. 
Now, a couple of other elements, though, that maybe a lot of people miss is that he's coming home with his rehearsed speech. His father sees him from a long way off, which, which means he was looking for him. And it says that he ran to him. Now, that's a very interesting detail because this is a nobleman. He owns land. And uh, uh, so he's a nobleman. He, he, nobleman would not run for two reasons. First of all, just running was considered an indignity um, to the nobility. Um, uh, you know, you people would think, well, you're either in flight, <laughs> you know, from some crime you've committed, <laughs> or you're a slave on an errand. So it wasn't. It didn't look good for a, a, a patriarch to be running. Uh, secondly, though, in order to run, you had to hike up your garments. You know, they say gird your loins. It means you know. You have to take the lower part of the, the long robes they would wear and sort of hike them up near the knees and then pull their cincture so they could free their legs to run. And showing your legs was also considered something of a, an embarrassment. Um, noblemen wouldn't do it. Um, again, maybe slaves or laborers or others you know, uh, would, would do it because they had to. But this was a much more modest culture and that they didn't show their legs except by absolute necessity. Now, uh, this is something, again, that's strange. What what nobleman, what father, especially to a son who had treated him this way, would so debase himself as to run to him? And then, uh, seeing, you know, he kisses him, puts a ring on his finger, and so on. You remember the household, and all these things symbolize, you know, that he's now, again, a member of the household. Praise God, see? So, even these details, you know, uh, about the father are already kind of crazy and shocking. Now, there's a party that ensues, as you know, because, again, the Father's saying there's such joy, you know, in heaven over a sinner who repents. And so he, he kills the fatted calf and has the party. And now the other son, this is where we, see, this is why it's important to remember the audience at the very beginning that we talked about. Um, there, there's an audience intended here, and um, it was described in the Pharisees who kind of, thought of their own righteousness as something they had, and they looked down on everybody else. So he's trying to say to them, see, my father doesn't see it that way. Hmm? You may think it's crazy. You may think it's crazy for me to eat with them. Uh, you may think, but I'm going to tell you, my father's crazy too. And so you start to see that now the second son enters the picture, and he's really the, the target of this part of the parable. Because um, the first son is home, thanks be to God. He's repented. He's home again. But... The second son, when he finds out about it, is angry and sullen and won't go into the feast. And once again, the father the father does something again that no ancient father would do. He came out, he said, from the party and pleaded with his son to enter. Come, he says, we must rejoice. This brother of yours was lost and is found. He was dead and has come back to life. We have to rejoice. And he's pleading with them. Well, ancient fathers didn't plead for their sons to do anything. You will be in this house, and if you dishonor me, there'll be serious consequences. You know, we're, we're done with this conversation. Get in here. But he pleads with them. And Jesus is saying, see, this is what my father is like. See, so often you, you dishonor him, but he's still looking for you. Lord, I've sinned, but you're still calling my name. Hmm? Now, the son, though, again, just gets it's very sullen. He's angry. He says, look, all these years, he says, I've slaved for you. Slaved? You're my son, you know. Slave? All these years I slaved you. I never disobeyed one of your commands. Commands. Hmm. You know, I thought you were my son and I was your father and that we we thought alike. What, do you, what, do you presume, what does he presume his father to be? He says, and he says, all these years you never even gave me a kid goat to celebrate with my friends. Now you, this son of yours is back and you killed a fatted calf. Now look at the way he's speaking to his father. Astonishing, really. He's, you know, and again, sons did not talk to their fathers this way and get away with it. And so it is, there's so many details in this parable that are like, whoa. And now we, we would see that, uh, um, that the parable comes to an end. Now we'll, we'll find out why that is and what actually happens. But, but, you start to see the, 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 the older son is very sullen and angry at the father's mercy for this other son. And this is directed to the Pharisees and the scribes. And Lord's saying, you know, watch out. If you, you're not on the side of God, you're kind of missing the whole point. 
And, you know, God may not always just do what you want or think, you know, he's going to crush sinners. You know, you're waiting for him to crush sinners. But at the end of the day, he may not see it the way you do. And, and by your standards, he may see, he may be crazy. And he puts up with a lot of garbage that, you know, earthly fathers, frankly, don't. So he's painting a picture of the father. Now, by the way, when the second son said, you never even gave me a kid goat to celebrate with my friends, remember, the goal in life isn't to celebrate with your friends. The goal in life is to celebrate with the father and all his friends, namely the saints. So uh, we see there's a lot of things wrong here. And again, the, there's, it ends, the parable ends with the father pleading for his son to enter, to re-enter the banquet. And uh, then the parable just ends. We don't know. Does the son change his mind? Does he repent? Does he go in? Or does he stay out refusing to go in? Well, it's not answered because you're the one who has to answer it. I have to answer it. What, would I go in? See, would I be outside angry? Or would I go in and rejoice? What would I do? What would these scribes and Pharisees do? See, you and I have to finish the parable. Now, um, this, too, is an image, if you will, for judgment, right? In that, in that there are, this is one of those images of judgment wherein it's not like somebody's trying to get into heaven. He's trying to stay out. He doesn't like the Father's mercy. He doesn't want it to be shown to sinners. And uh, no matter whether they've repented or not, you know, I mean, they're just sinners need to be destroyed from the face of the earth. Well, that was kind of the thinking, and I don't care for a God who wants to welcome someone who spent their life as a sinner. And how did that son see his life? I never disobeyed one of your commands. I, 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 you know, I slaved for you. Is that how you see your relationship with God? I hope not. You know, I mean, his commands are liberating. And uh, his, um, you know, he's, we're not slaving for him. He, we've, we've, he's called it to freely love him. So you see, there's a lot of things askew in the second son. And his problems are more uh, subtle and layered. Whereas the first son, it was pretty much, uh, you know, uh, sins of the flesh and run off and um, uh, do what he pleases, and he finally comes to a sense of But this son's a little more complicated. He's convinced that he's in the right. And that's a very dangerous place to be when you're that way of vis-a-vis God. Okay. So, again, I, I need to keep it brief. We're going to wrap this up. But I want to just say that this parable sort of shakes things up a little. And I, I like to interpret these parables kind of as, this is sort of like crazy talk of, um, why would a woman lose one coin even though she has nine others and run around searching for it and then have a party that cost almost the value of the coin? I, I, that's crazy. Yeah, that's the point. It's crazy from our point of view how, how merciful God is, how much he forgives. It's crazy. But as the parable also shows, there comes a moment when you do have to make a decision and I whether we want his mercy and whether we're willing to enter into the party celebrating that mercy. And that's, so his, his mercy abounds, but only if uh, he's not going to force it on us. He's not going to say, you've got to receive my mercy, whether you want to or not, whether you think you need it or not. I mean, it's like somebody coming up to you and saying, you know, I forgive you for what you said to me yesterday. You say, well, you know, you think, well, gee, what did I say? I don't think I said, I don't think I need forgiveness. I think I said what needed to be said. And uh, so, you know, when a person pushes their mercy on you, it's a kind of a form of, of um, you know, sort of being... Um, passive aggressive it's just it's very poorly received and so god's not going to force us to think it's first of all acknowledge that we need his mercy and he's not going to force us to celebrate it and receive it um it's ours if we want it but he's pleading i can't change i am who i am and the party is what it is heaven namely the, the party you got to decide do you want what i'm offering so that's the question that's left for you and me do we want this kind of a God, this kind of, I, I think a lot of us have been trained in the school of mercy, whereas at, at that time, these people were trained much more in the idea that, you know, you keep these precepts and you're righteous, and if you don't, you're a sinner and God's going to crush you, and that'll be a just day to see sinners crushed. And that's, but we're, most of us are trained today in the mercy of God, almost to a fault, but nevertheless, it's a great thing to celebrate. You know, God is so merci merciful. But remember, it's repentance. It's, that's the key that unlocks mercy. See? And uh, so this isn't just, you know, mercy whether you want it or not. This is a mercy you and I have to decide. I need it. I want it. And I'm going to celebrate with you and everyone else who needs it. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit.
All right, so this is all a little crazy from worldly perspectives, you know. Um, but God doesn't think like we do. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my thoughts above your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways above your ways. And so this, these two, these parables are a call to repentance, to change the way we think about ourselves and how we relate to God and how about we relate to other sinners, other sinners relate to God like us and how we relate to each other. And that's the summons of these parables, which <laughs> are crazy. God's crazy to love us. But aren't you glad he's crazy? Because <laughs> we, and again, I mean that in a very uh, hyperbolic, but also a very loving way. All right. So thank the Lord for his mercy this very day, shown not just to you, but shown to others as well. Amen.